OK, good morning. Uh, so this lecture should be a little bit more chill than the last lecture. The last lecture, we just proved a theorem for 80 minutes. But today, I'm going to just tell you some stuff about a basic topic, circuits. Um, if you recall from lecture one, I said there's sort of three themes in this, this uh, class. The first one is you know, time complexity and space complexity, which we saw in the last lecture, and circuits, which we'll talk about today, and also randomness, which we may talk a little bit about today if we get the time. So, circuits. Well, I guess you know what a circuit is. It's, I always throw out like a triangle, and uh, it's got a bunch of inputs and Boolean inputs. In the context of circuits, we assume our languages are just 0, 1 strings all the time. And usually it's got one output bit, and then it has some gates inside, like AND gates, and OR gates, and NOT gates. You can consider different gates, but we'll just stick with these for now. And we'll also, for now, unless otherwise specified, assume that the AND and OR gates have fan in 2. But we will specify otherwise later in this lecture. Um, so that's a circuit C. And it's a combinatorial object. And sometimes we associate it or identify it with the function it computes as well. Okay, so it takes n bit string in the wires and outputs a bit. And that's how we usually draw it. But uh, you might think a little bit about how you would actually represent it. Um, you know, if it was like the input to a problem was a circuit. And the way, I mean, you would really represent it or, in fact, define it is just by, uh, it looks a bit like a, a list or like a, a programming language. Um, you just list the gates and their types and inputs. So, like, really the formal way to describe a circuit looks like this. Uh, you've got a gate number and a type. And then you got its, you know, incoming numbers. <coughs> uh, so you have gates, one, two up to n. And uh, these are the input gates. So we consider the uh, input wires to be gates. And then after that, you get started with like the real computation. So gate number n plus 1 is perhaps you know, an AND gate. And you say for an AND gate, you know, what its two incoming wires are. So our gates are, I should say, so maybe 1 and 3. And then n gate n plus 2 is maybe an OR gate with, uh, I don't know, inputs 2 and n plus 1, okay, and so forth. Of course, uh, you know, you should only, this is supposed to be a directed acyclic graph, right? So you should only have incoming gates uh, that are of a lower number than the, the gate that you're specifying. And we can just assume that the last gate is output gate. So maybe the last gate in the list is an OR or something with some two inputs. And uh, we'll call that S. Because usually we refer to uh, the number of gates uh, as the size of the circuit and call that S. OK, so this is what like, uh, I guess the circuit really is, but we usually you know, draw pictures of them. OK, so circuits compute Boolean functions. Yeah? Yeah, that's like always a painful question, whether you consider the input gates to count towards the size. It's up to you, but let's say yes for now. Um, OK, so uh, as always, we're interested in complexity measures for these models of computation. So the main one is size, which is the number of gates. Um, notice that in this model, the number of gates is also proportional to the number of uh, wires. So it's also proportional, basically, to the size of this table. That's just because every gate only has two incoming wires. And roughly speaking, if you want to compare this with you know, algorithms or Turing machines, roughly speaking, size is kind of like time, sequential time, in the sense that let, let's say you were an algorithm evaluating a given circuit on a given input. It would take you time roughly proportional to the number of gates. Right? OK, and the other uh, measure of complexity that's a little less interesting, but still interesting, is depth, which is the longest path from, I mean, it's the graph theoretic depth, so the longest path from input to output. And in some rough sense, depth corresponds a little somewhat to um, parallel time complexity. So for example, if you imagine like you had like a, 
sort of unlimited parallelism, or at least, you know, you could put like a processor on every gate, you know, evaluating a circuit would still take you some amount of time because like the higher, you know, gates have to wait for the lower gates to compute their output. So, you know, the longest input output length path is sort of like the, the parallel time, roughly speaking. Um, good. Now, the funny thing, as mentioned in lecture one about circuits, which is in contrast to Turing machines or other models for algorithms, is that circuits have a uh, fixed input size. <coughs> which, as we'll see in this lecture, is a little bit weird. Um, but we'll have to uh, deal with this. And um, this is uh, sometimes uh, called I don't know how to phrase this. It's sometimes associated with the phrase non-uniform model of computation. So I'm not exactly sure who came up with that name, but when you hear the phrase non-uniform model of computation, it, it means you have like a different algorithm or a different object for each different input length, which is, as I said, mildly weird. Um, so, you know, as such, one circuit cannot, it doesn't make sense to ask if it can like decide a language because languages can have in, uh, strings of any input length. So the actual object that can decide a language that we are able to compare to other things like Turing machines is the circuit family. So circuit family is just a collection of circuits, Cn, one for each potential input length, um, where, as I say, C, of N, C sub n has n inputs. Okay, so it's a circuit for length zero, a circuit for length one, a circuit for length two, and so forth and so on. Uh, so it's an infinite object. I mean, there's infinitely many circuits in it. But now at least it can, it can compute a language. So uh, such a circuit family can compute or decide a language, okay, over the alphabet zero one. Okay, so now it's the kind of thing that we can compared to Turing machines and so forth. Um, okay, and so in terms of, uh, you know, just like whenever we have a language, we can ask about like um, the time complexity of computing it. For circuits, you ask about the size complexity of circuit families that compute it. Okay, so once you have a circuit family, you know, you have a, a size for each input length, S, and so you have like a size function, S of N, and that's like the running time function of a Turing machine. So we, are, we care about like what is this function S of n like, you know, as n scales, like in the context of big O. So just like we could define a complexity class time T of n, we can define a complexity class of language called size S of n. Okay, and this is the class of all languages, let's say in zero, one star, uh, that are computable by a circuit family Cn uh, of size uh, order S of n, big O of S of n. Okay, so just like with uh, the complexity class time T of n, uh, we just put the big O into the definition because we don't want to get stressed about constants. Although actually one thing I could say about circuits is it's like much more natural to care about constants. Like it's extremely explicit. Everything is kind of fixed. So you, you actually may at some point in your life care about like literally the constant factors when talking about circuits, but let's leave it out and define this class this way. Okay, so that's size S of n. And now, um, now we get a natural analog of P, polynomial time in the context of circuits. And for some like weird reason, which I will explain uh, in this class, uh, this, uh, this analog of P is called P slash poly. So this is a complexity class, and it's, you know, size poly n. Again, this is slightly uh, bad notation. Maybe I should, you know, say it's oh, the union over all C of size n to the C. Okay. So it's uh, the class of all languages that can be decided by polynomial size circuit families. Okay, and we're going to compare this class to P today, but you should think of it with respect to P. Okay, any questions so far? 
All right, so uh, let me mention a two other complexity classes that can be defined uh, using circuits. There are lots of complexity classes you can define uh, using circuits, but you know, here are a couple important ones. These are uh, subclasses of P slash poly. Okay, so you know, they're more restrictive than just polynomial size circuits, uh, but they're nice ones. So one is called um, uh, NC. That's always like there's terrible names for all these things. This stands, believe it or not, for Nick's class. Nick, not that guy, but uh, Nick Pippinger. So this is the, uh, the languages computable by um, poly n size and a polylog depth circuit families. Okay. And I, you mean simultaneous polynomial size and polylog depth. Um, so there's a circuit family where every circuit has at most you know, n squared size and at most log n cubed depth simultaneously. And this is some, uh, sometimes like roughly equated with uh, the class of things that have efficient, parallel, like highly efficient parallel algorithms. Okay, if you think about circuit uh, depth as having something to do with parallel time, then you know, polylog is like a good uh, amount to strive for. Okay, so you know, these are things that you could really solve in polylog time if you had polynomially many processors. Okay, so that's a subclass of p slash poly, and it's an, it's an interesting one. Um, and let me mention one more, uh, which is quite interesting, which is uh, called AC0. This stands for alternating, uh, for reasons maybe we may eventually see, and somehow the zero stands for constant. Um, never mind. So it's languages computable by poly n size constant depth circuits. Circuit families. Now, uh, we have to say a few extra things here. Um, so as I said, unless otherwise specified, our AND and OR gates have fan in two. Well, now it's time for me to otherwise specify. Uh, as we actually discussed in, in lecture one, if you're gonna have constant depth, like depth 10, then if you have fan in at most two, even the output gate will only depend on at most 1,024 input uh, gates. So that's a very overly restrictive um, scenario. So whenever you're in the context of constant depth circuits, um, it's assumed that you allow AND and OR gates of unbounded Fanon. Okay, so whenever you're talking constant depth circuits, let me write this. You always allow AND and OR gates of unbounded Fanon. And then you can, uh, compute several interesting languages or solve interesting problems. For example, to add two n bit numbers and output their n plus one bit sum, uh, you can do this with a constant depth circuit of polynomial size. And I suppose actually at this step you should also change what size means to be the number of wires because now when you have unbounded fan in, it's not like there's a linear relationship between the number of gates and wires. This is usually actually not such a big deal, but let me just do it anyway, so we're being a little bit careful. You know, you should, you know, the size of a circuit should really have something to do with its, its representation size. Okay, and uh, this AC0, it's, uh, it's an even smaller class um, than NC. It's really like the, the problems that can be solved in, one second, um, constant parallel time. So for example, this is like a good model for like, you know, what kind of instructions it's reasonable to allow as like in like a, in like a, a, a RAM architecture model, if you're trying to model that in, in uh, theory, you know, and you say to yourself, oh, should I be allowed to add two n-bit integers and or two log n-bit integers in, in constant time? Um, the answer should be yes. So I think like, you know, constant uh, depth circuits are a good model for what instructions should be allowable. Yeah, Corwin? Uh, talk about things in between constant depth and polylog depth. Yeah, you can. So uh, first of all, I guess I should mention that like this AC0 is a subclass of NC because 
you know, if you have uh, an unbounded fan in AND gate, you can like convert it to like a binary tree of ANDs at the expense of like log n depth. So um, there's that. And yeah, there's a whole hierarchy here. So like NC, you know, people define NCK, that's like depth log to the K. And then like NC is the union of that overall K. And people also define ACK as like uh, unbounded fan in, but like depth, I guess log to the K as well. But somehow, somehow these are like the most interesting basic classes. But yeah, you can really get into like lots of details about different kinds of circuit classes. Yeah, there's a question. Oh, I was just going to ask. Uh, for the NC, the, the N or K doesn't it's still restricts to fan two. Yeah, I think it doesn't really matter uh, if you're if you're you know a little bit laid back about like polynomial the polynomial in here and here because you can always like take a uh, arbitrary fan in and gate and convert it to like a depth log n at most tree of fan in two gates. Great. So that could blow up your depth by like a log factor, but as long as you put polylog in there, it doesn't matter. Okay, so that's sort of it for the definitions of circuit classes we'll talk about. And I really just actually put an NC and AC0 up there because we'll talk about them later in the course. But today we'll just um, not worry about them so much and talk more about P slash poly, the most basic one. So let's go back to this uh, funny issue of the fact that it's a non circuits, you know, P slash poly is like a non uniform model of computation. And uh, grapple with this a little bit. Um, so for example, here's a funny fact. Um, every unary language, okay, so every language that, uh, it's just a collection of strings over uh, a single character, one, is in p slash poly. Okay, in fact, it's in AC0. Can somebody say why that is? Or how you can prove that? Um, I guess you're, you're allowed to just have a different, a different circuit for every language, so you can just like decide. Right, so for every um, number n, you know, 1 to the n is either in the language or it's not in the language. If it's not in the language, your nth circuit will just always output 0. I don't know, like x1 and not x1. Uh, and if it's uh, in the language, then I guess your circuit has to check that all the bits are 1. So it can just do the and of all the input bits. And yeah, that would decide the language. So in fact, it's like a, you have like almost a trivial circuit family for any particular L. Of course, that heavily exploits the fact that you're allowed to use like a different circuit for every input length. Is that clear? So that's a little stressful because of the following uh, fact. Um, there exists undecidable languages. L, which are a subset of one star. Uh, can anybody say one? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, for example, uh, it can be like all the strings uh, consisting of n ones, where if you like look at the binary zero one representation of the number n, and then interpret this as a Turing machine, you know, it halts on an empty tape. Okay, so this is undecidable. You know, there's some, you know, maybe exponential time blow up and going between unary and binary, but like in the context of decidability, that's nothing. Um, okay, so uh, now we're in like a funny situation where we define this at first reasonable looking complexity class, but then it can decide undecidable languages, which is kind of weird. Um, but, well, that's life. Uh, what, the, the trouble here, or like the non-realism here, I mean, I mean, does this mean that like we can solve the halting problem in real life or something? Well, no. See, the, the non-uniform model like neglects one aspect of life, which is like the computational complexity of describing the nth circuit. Um, so in, in real life, I mean, if you want to you know, use a circuit family to solve a problem, like first you have to like produce the circuit. And if that itself is like a super complicated procedure, which it like would be in this case, then you know, maybe it's not so realistic. On the other hand, there are some circumstances which is like this is actually a natural model. Like for example, I don't know if you're thinking about like circuits to like crack, uh, you know, SHA-256 or whatever. Like you really care about like 
circuits that take 256 bits of input. And maybe you don't mind like imagining that like you have like unlimited or like super long computation time to figure out like what is a good circuit. But for the most part, we kind of are not into uh, that, allowing like sort of unbounded complexity for the process of computing the description of the nth circuit. So there's a, a definition for know, ameliorating this situation. Okay, so a circuit family uh, CN is called P uniform if uh, there is a polynomial time algorithm for outputting the nth circuit. So if there exists um, a poly n time algorithm uh, computing the function, uh, let me write it like this. This is like, you'll get used to this like complexity theory habit. This is like a little bit weird. Um, Computing the function which takes as input like n ones and outputs the description of uh, C n, you know, in the sense of like the list of gates. And I just write it like this because like it's such an ingrained habit to like measure the running time as a function of the input length that like you you write the input here like n in unary to sort of specify that like yes you get polynomial in n time to output the nth circuit, not polynomial in log n time. Okay, so this is like a weird complexity theory habit when they sort of want to specify that you get time n. A uh, polynomial in n, they'll say, oh, the input is n ones. Okay, so, uh, and this, you know, I mean, like some standard encoding of the nth circuit. So this captures the idea that, like, oh, it'd be, it'd be nice if, like, you know, there's an, al you know, an efficient algorithm for outputting the nth circuit. Um, and one, one thing that we'll see later in this lecture is that if you restrict attention uh, to the P uniform circuits, circuit families in P slash poly, like if you look at you know, polynomial size families of circuits with the additional property that they're P uniform, then the set of languages that they decide is P, you know, the language decidable in polynomial time. Yeah? But you said that the P uniform circuit families are in P slash poly, so are there circuit families that are P uniform not in P slash poly? Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about, um, you can apply this notion of uniformity to like classes other than p slash poly, like bigger classes or smaller classes. And there are also, as I'll say in a second, other notions of uniformity, but like, maybe I don't quite appreciate your question, but like, I don't know. Because like, oh, I guess the question, one is kind of what so. Like, how, how do you output uh, a thing that's bigger than poly size and poly time? Oh, yeah, so then, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say in a second, but like, um, you know, uniformity, uh, time-based uniformity would be uh, give you polynomial in the size of the circuit that you're outputting, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to come to that in actually just a, a second. Let me say one direction between these equalities is easy. I guess this direction is easy. So why is that? Let's say you have a polynomial time computable family of circuits of polynomial size um, that decides some language. I guess I'm claiming that that language can be solved in polynomial time on a Turing machine. How do you do it? Well, you get an input, figure out its length, n. Then you run the, the, this algorithm to get the description of the circuit. It's some polynomial size circuit with n inputs. And then you evaluate the input on that circuit. And evaluating a circuit on a given input is clearly a polynomial time operation. In fact, it's polynomial time complete. Okay, so the other direction, well, what we'll see in this class, but the, like for every language solvable in polynomial time, it has a poly size circuit family that's easy to compute. I'll talk about that again uh, later. Um, so now you can uh, apply this notion of uniformity to these other complexity classes, say, and like this, in general, like, insisting that a circuit family be uniform is like a good way to turn a non-uniform complexity class, like NC, into like a uniform complexity class that can be compared with all the other classes we know, like, I don't know, P-space, or like polynomial time, or L, or whatever. Okay, so like, 
it's a way to like turn like to invent um, circuit-based complexity classes that can be fit into the, the usual picture. So, uh, for example, you can define uh, the uniform complexity class P uniform N C. Now, I have to think a little bit about does this make sense? So, on one hand, it, uh, the, the issue that's a bit funny with this is that in some sense N C is um, roughly speaking, you know, it's smaller than P slash poly, so it's sort of more restrictive than polynomial time slash size. And you might think it's a little bit funny that the algorithm for constructing the circuit sort of has more power in a way than the circuits themselves. Maybe that's funny, right? Like you might say, oh, if a language is in P uniform NC, is that weird? Like, did a lot of the computation happen within the, the circuit construction algorithm or is it really like it, it's really happening in the circuit? So, um, it's not totally weird, like this might make sense, like imagine you're like a chip design and you're like, I would like to have a really efficient parallel chip for solving some language. Maybe I don't mind like if it takes me a long time to figure out how to design the chip because like once I have it, it's going to operate very efficiently in parallel. So it kind of makes sense, but in complexity theory we think it's like a little bit weird to um, sort of allow more power to the like circuit dis dis construction algorithm than sort of the circuits themselves. Which sort of implies that you might want a more restrictive notion of uniformity where like the circuit construction algorithm had to be even simpler than polynomial time. So this is getting a little technical, but I do want to bring it up because it will come up like later in the course. Um, but bear in mind that things I'll tell you in the next five minutes are a little bit technical. Um, so you can also define um, L uniform. Here L is standing for log space, the complexity class. And that just means that uh, this function is computable in log space. And now maybe I'll take you the opportunity to remind you what it means for something to be computable in log space. See, it's a little bit funny if you have only logarithmic space, but you're, you've got to output something that has length in bits, at least n. Well, uh, there's two equivalent ways to define it. Um, you can either imagine that like the Turing machine has a write once output tape. So in log space, you always have a read only input tape and some work tapes that are read write that have logarithmic amount of space. But if you need to output something, then you can imagine having a write once output tape. So not just write only, but you have to output it in successive order. Or another way to define it is like, you know, you get as input n and also some number j and you have to output the jth bit of the description of this. Okay, so it's a bit technical but you know it's like a it's an even stronger condition than uh, p uniform. And intuitively just says like the description of the cir nth circuit is not just simple but it's like really simple. Okay, and somehow um, you know logarithmic space is uh, somehow less powerful than nc. That statement doesn't quite make sense because NC is a non-uniform class, but um, the uniform version of it is more powerful than L. So um, this is like a good kind of uh, model for the uniformity level of NC. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's clear that this is a more restrictive model. But is there a specific relationship between the log space for Turing machine and the log depths for the circuit family? Mm, not so much. So, um, well, uh, L uniform NC is a uniform complexity class which contains L. Um, okay, yeah, so yeah, larger. Just yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. And while we're here, I will mention the maximally technical uh, thing, which is that even more restrictive notion, but it will come up for us, I think, at some point, uh, which is called D log time uniform. And uh, to properly define this would take like a paragraph, which I don't want to do. So let me just say, uh, basically, uh, it means you can compute this in logarithmic time, which is even more restrictive. But uh, so basically, that means you can test. Uh, the question like, is gate i of type t and uh, is, you know, gate u feeding into gate 
V in uh, time, which is like order log the size of the, the circuit time. Okay, so uh, usually that's order log n time. And for this to even make sense, like you have to allow like random access to the tape. Okay, so I really don't want to get into the details too much. Um, but it's sort of like some super hyper efficient notion of like the circuits being really easily to, easy to compute. And uh, partly I bring it up because look, it'll, maybe it's a buzzword you'll uh, encounter. Like if you're a really tough complexity theorist and whenever you're doing like, you know, saying that something is a uniform version of a complexity class, like you strive for this D log time uniform. Um, basically, I think in practice, like, nobody cares about, like, oh, whether your circuits are L uniform or D log time uniform. But it does come up a little bit um, when, it's like an interesting uh, notion for when you're inventing complexity classes based on exponential size circuits, which is something we will do. Um, for example, if you've seen this before, like, like the polynomial time hierarchy uh, is kind of like, um, a uniform version of AC0, but for exponential size circuits. And that's like literally true if you impose this uniformity condition. But, okay, that's some like technicalities that maybe we'll eventually encounter, and I thought I should say them today, but don't get too stressed about them. Any questions? Okay, so, Let's go back to the less crazy stuff. Um, yeah, so uh, let's sort of do the other direction of this. Uh, that P is contained in P slash poly. And not only that, but like in a uniform way. So in other words, if you have a, a Turing machine that decides some language in polynomial time, you can also build a, a polynomial size circuit family, and in fact, like a nice uniform one that also decides the same language. Uh, so here's a theorem which I think you've seen before, hopefully, in some context, either explicitly or it's basically the proof of the Cook-Levin theorem or it's like embedded into the proof of the Cook-Levin theorem. Uh, so P is contained in P slash poly. And not only that, but like the P uniform. Okay, so this is a boring theorem to actually prove, so I won't. Um, but I'll draw a picture, which you've probably seen before, uh, of a sketch. Like, let's imagine you have um, some time T of N Turing machine, you know, multi-tape Turing machine M. Okay, it decides some language, and we want to, like, make a circuit family that decides the same uh, language. Okay, so our circuit is kind of going to, like, look like the computation tableau of M. Okay, so, like, we're going to have, like, you know, the circuit's going to kind of compute like what's tape, M's tape looks like at time one and then at time two and at time three and time four up to time T of N. And, you know, the tape itself could have length T because this machine runs in time T, so it uses at most, you know, T uh, tape cells. So, like, initially, like the inputs, I'm going to draw a picture of the circuit here, like a highly stylized one. The inputs to the circuit go here. And then this is a picture of a circuit, really. Uh, of width t. And then uh, these are going to be gates that sort of store the information about like what the tape looks like at time one, time two, time three, all the way down to time uh, t, which is how many time steps m uses. Uh, I'm drawing it as though m were a one tape Turing machine, but it's not a big deal. Like if m is a two tape Turing machine, then you know you'll have twice as much information here in each of these rows, but it's just a constant factor. And uh, what else goes on? So this is, yeah, going to like, these things are going to have like tape contents, plus like the state is going to be like written or stored in like gates here. Um, or you're going to imagine that like maybe the Turing machine like marks what state it's in on the tape. So basically like, you know, these are, are gates. You'll have some like little circuit gadgetry here. I don't know, ands and ors and stuff that kind of checks that like these 
cells of the tape are consistent with like the cells and head position and previous time steps. So like, you know, either this thing that like checks up here that either the head was not here, in which case these bits should be the same as these bits, or the head was up here, and then it checks that like the new bits here are what they're supposed to be given what the head was reading and what the, the state was. So, and you put this gadget tree just like everywhere. It's like just copied everywhere between all the layers. And then you can assume, let's say the Turing machine cleans up and like writes its final accept reject in like the leftmost cell or something at the end. So that's your output. So this is a circuit that's drawn downward. I don't want to say too much more about that, uh, but are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> what a loaded question for me to ask. Um, yeah, I mean, to take care of it takes a little bit of pain, but it's not so bad. Uh, so this natural construction takes a time t of n Turing machine to a, a circuit uh, of size order t squared. Well, the nth circuit is of size order t of n squared because you have the width t and uh, height t. And I would also like to say this, this family is polynomial time uniform because this circuit is very, very simple. Like it's basically the same gadgetry repeated like everywhere. Um, so that's good. Uh, so the P uniform check. Maybe you need to assume, I don't even care to know, but maybe you need to assume that like T is time constructible or something, but I didn't even bother to think about that. Um, I guess it's fine. I mean, uh, if you're in P, then you're in time like N to the C for some constant C, and then all those N to the Cs are time constructible. Um, good. Okay, so this gives you a time, takes a time t-turing machine to a size t of n squared uh, circuit family. That's uniform. Is that a question? This question's a little silly, but uh, does anybody ever think about whether you can, like, anyone ever worries about, like, turing machines where the number of t's is a lot of the variance of function of n? Uh, I think people have probably worried about that or thought about that, um, but I suppose maybe it did not prove to be that interesting because I don't know, like, many results about that. Um, yeah. Uh, so let me just tell you, in fact, not only is this construction uh, P uniform, but it's like also, if you like care to look into it, L uniform. In fact, it's also like if you really care to look into it, D log time uniform. Just because like, this is really like some constant size circuit depending on the Turing machine's description and then like it's basically just repeated <laughs> everywhere. So like it's, it's extremely simple to describe. And further, one more thing that is important is that um, there's a construction that's better than this. This is an easy one. You can actually get a construction uh, which has size t log t. And sometimes we do care about that because it really shows that time and circuit size are almost equivalent. It's like up to a log factor. So you don't actually need to lose this square. And that is nice to know. It's important actually in complexity theory, especially in the context of Cook-Levin theorem, uh, which uses this construction. And um, you know, sh this shows that like, you know, non-deterministic time t is like um, reducible to circuit sat for circuits of size t log t, which is nice to know. Uh, and let me just say, I'm not going to prove it because it's hard, but like uh, how this goes. Uh, it uses a concept called oblivious Turing machines. So a Turing machine is called oblivious if uh, the head movements only depend on n and not on the input. So if a Turing machine, an oblivious Turing machine is quite funny, uh, how its head moves back and forth over the tape, or heads in the multi-tape case, only depends on the input length. It does not depend on what the actual input is. At first, for like one second, you might think like, that seems somewhat uh, implausible that you could have that. But then after like five minutes, it's like not so hard to see how to convert any Turing machine running in some amount of time t to an oblivious Turing machine running in time uh, t squared, actually. And the hint for that is, um, well, the head movement looks like this. If you go back and forth, like, you know, t time, 
And you know, you have to like, uh, you know, do tricks like, uh, you don't, you write, you know, you mark the position of like the real tape ahead that you're simulating like on the tape and then like as you pass it this way, you like do an update here if you need to. And then as you pass it back this way, you like keep looking for where the real head is and you like update the tape as necessary when you do it this way. Yeah? So do you get from uh, uh, P is in P poly uh, that's P long time uniform that P is equal to P poly that's P long time uniform? Uh, yes. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. so uh, this theorem is equally true if I wrote uh, L uniform and it's equally true if I wrote D long time uniform here. Okay, so why do I bring up oblivious Turing machines? Well, uh, uh, I didn't say it. I'm merely leaving yeah, it as well, a hint. Yeah, but like, um, you know, so the the Turing machine's head movements, which are only allowed to depend on the input length, will like look like this. Like it'll go one character over and then back and then two and then back and then three and then back and then maybe it'll do this for like t of n time. But like it's going like t of n distance and maybe also t of n time. So that might take t of n squared time. And like you just have to, you, the machine you're simulating, like have the machine you're simulating like not so much keep its actual state in its state, but like have it write its state and head position to the tape everywhere. So you can sort of simulate like one step of the Turing machine you're simulating, like as you pass wherever the head location is marked on the tape, like in this zigzag. Um, the behavior depends on the input. Behavior does, but not the head movement behavior. No, I mean in the original tuning machine it does, right? Oh yeah, it does. Okay, so how we transform that? Uh, I'm, just, I'm just lost. Wait. So, so the, the head movements of the original tuning machine depends on the input? Right. So the, like, the first step is you take the original Turing machine, okay. which, where the head movement depends on everything, and you like change it up a little so that like as it's going along it like marks at every step, like where the head is onto the tape, and like also what state it's in. And then you can simulate that in an oblivious fashion by um, looking at that tape. Maybe I'm not explaining it very well, but like okay, it's an exercise <laughs> akin to, like, yeah. Yeah? Just going back to box space. So when you said there was a right one to the tape, does that mean you can't read it? That's right, you can't go back and read what you've written. Yeah. Does it also mean you have to write it like at one go or is it you can write parts of it? Yeah, well you can write like a character and then like you can, so the write only tape uh, has, you can stay put. So it has like move right or stay put. So you can like write a character, work for a while, then write the next character, then work for a while. Yep. Right Pardon me? From left to right. Yeah, left to right, left to right order. So you can think about like why that's the same as like defining log space uh, machines with output as taking an extra input j, which is supposed to be the, the you know, where the task is to output the jth bit of the the long output. So those are interreducible in log space. It's not too hard to show. Yep. Uh, sorry, I missed the part where you said uh, also get. I, uh, let me finish. I'm, yeah, I, I, let me finish what I was talking about on that pane, and then I'll come back to you. So, um, right. So, how do you get this t log t? Well, the first step is introducing this notion of oblivious Turing machines, and as I said in words, um, it's not too hard to take a time. Okay, so there, there are two important facts. One is if you have a time t oblivious Turing machine, you can convert it to a size order t circuit family. And this is not hard. Again, I'll, I'll call it an exercise. Um, if your Turing machine is so lucky as to be oblivious, then you can make a circuit family that does the same thing with like basically no blow up. And like at a super high level, it's because like you don't need to like always be like looking like, oh, perhaps the head was up here or perhaps it was up here. And so you need like uh, all this gadgetry. At every time step, like you know exactly where the head is because it's oblivious. So like on the 57th time step, you like know for sure. In the previous time step, it was at 56. So like you don't need all this gadgetry. You can just like have the, the snapshot for like what's on the tape where the head is. So you know where the head is and like just li link it up there. Okay, so that's, I don't expect you to see it immediately, but that's like a, a hint to the exercise, which is not that hard. 
Okay, so this is the strategy, and then it's a fact due to uh, Pippinger and Fisher from like the early 80s that you can uh, take a time T multi tape Turing machine and convert it to an order T log T time oblivious Turing machine. And in fact, Remember that insanity from the time complexity, uh, time hierarchy theorem lecture, where we saw there was another hard theorem that said if you have like a K tape Turing machine running in time T, you can convert it to a two tape Turing machine running in time T log T. So like what they actually did is show that like furthermore you can make that oblivious. So like all of like the craziness of like taking an arbitrary Turing machine in time T and making it super nice, like two tapes and oblivious can be done with only this T log T blow up. It's painful and technical, but it's in the textbook. Like Aurora and Barack, maybe they skip the obliviousness a, a little bit, but it's in the textbook. So you can do it, and then uh, I'll leave it at that. I mean, that, that, that's tricky. But I think we're done with programming Turing machines. Uh, yep? Yeah. You need T depth uh, because, like, basically you'll keep track of things. But, like, you know, to simulate in some sense the jth step, like, what do you need to know? You kind of need to know, like, what's on the tape uh, around, like, maybe within distance one of the position associated with the jth time step. And the function that maps like position, time step to position is like a fixed, simple, deterministic function. That's obliviousness. So like you, uh, like you know you're going like to need to know about like what's on character 58 of the tape cell. Like the last time you were in character, uh, around character 58 is like some specific time that you knew previously. Yeah? Well, I'll take your question first. So this is kind of silly, but do we want the function that tells us where the net position is to be like computable? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, depends if so. That's a good question. Uh, depends if you want this this construction to be uniform or not. Right. If it's if you're willing to this circumference to be non-uniform, then it's enough that this head uh, tape position function exists. But like you can also so everything like you can also make everything like uniform. By observing this theorem, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, somebody else had a question. Yeah. I think so, but I'm not totally sure. Uh, it's hard to find out these details because people don't care so much. But it does. It is important. Uh, so I don't exactly know. But like, for example, I know just for p being and p slash poly. You can even make a d log time uniform. I think probably even all this is d log time uniform, but I don't know for sure. Yeah? Yeah, that's what I was about. So, so the, uh, the computation of, of the tape head function, it corresponds to like what kind of uniformity you get, right? Yeah, so like you really want that to be really quite simple to compute if you were shooting for like awesome uniformity. There's like some textbook by like Volmer that like really gets into this stuff. So if you're into it, you can check it out. <coughs> okay, it literally says on my slide, uh, my like notes, like end of most boring technicalities at this point. <laughs> so let's go back to non-uniformity. Uh, so in fact, I mean, one interesting thing about circuits is if you don't impose uniformity. Uniformity, they can compute any function. Any Boolean function can be computed by a circuit. You probably know this. In fact, any Boolean function can be computed by like a DNF, which is a particularly simple kind of depth to circuit. So this is a uh, Shannon in 49, like invented circuits kind of. Uh, and he proved the following two facts. These are Shannon, famous theorem. First one is a lower bound. Uh, it's a use of the probabilistic method very early in mathematics. For all n, uh, there exists a Boolean function on n inputs requiring a circuit size uh, at least 2 to the n over n. That's literally like times 1, 2 to the n over n. 
Um, it's like a counting argument or like a random function does the, has the property with high probability. So that's one awesome thing that he proved. But conversely, he also showed, and this is not hard, um, all fu functions on n bits can be done uh, with size circuits. I know it's four times this. Okay, so uh, getting um, n times 2 to the n, n times 2 to the n is trivial if you just like use a DNF in the most obvious way to compute the function. But this is also not a hard construction. It's by um, divide and conquer. And there's a famous theorem of Lupinov from like the 60s that gets this 4 down to like 1 plus little of 1. So like this exactly matches. Almost all functions need circuit size 1 plus little of 1 times this. But this is also pretty tight. and We can just worry about that. And uh, one reason I bring this up is it's an easy corollary of this that you have like a, a hierarchy theorem, like a size hierarchy theorem for circuits. Size hierarchy theorem for circuits, which basically says, you know, more circuit size gives you the ability to compute more functions. So uh, what I'll write is not even the sharpest version of it, but uh, for all circuit size bounds, little s of n, which are, let's say, at least n, which is uh, little o of capital S of n. Um, and S of capital S of n should be at most uh, 2 to the n over n. Um, size little s of n, of course, is contained in size capital S of n. That's trivial. But it's a strict containment. OK. So if I give you, um, you know, asymptotically strictly more size, then you can compute strictly more languages. And with our notation, this is like the best kind of hierarchy theorem you could hope for, because it, our notation has big O built into this. In fact, like if you really don't want to build in big O notation, like you can, you know, get that size little s of n is strictly contained in size like four or five times s of n, which is even sharper. But we won't worry about uh, going that crazy. And how do you prove this? Um, well, it just uses this uh, star, the, the Shannon's first theorem, that there are some hard to compute functions. So let me just, again, perhaps make this a little sketch. But it's really easy to fill in this sketch. Just take. You know, given little s and big S, just take k, an integer, just large enough, enough, uh, so that 2 to the k over k is strictly uh, bigger than little s of n. So k is a function of n. Um, OK, and then just take any function that can't can be computed by uh, uh, SN size circuits and apply this to uh, you know the first k inputs. So yeah, what I mean to say is like take a function that requires circuit size two to the n over n, and then like make a new function that is like that function embedded on the first k inputs of the real inputs, and It'll require about this uh, size, but if I give you like four times more size, you can definitely compute it. I didn't explain that super well, but it's very trivial, so I'll leave it to you. Okay, good. So that's a nice analogy with uh, the time hierarchy theorem. Okay, so we know that there are some problems that are hard to compute by circuits of a fixed size, but if I give you a bit more size, you can do it. Um, just on this subject, I mean, so this is where the whole game of uh, circuit lower bounds, trying to prove circuit lower bounds, come in. So Shannon showed that there exist some functions that require um, almost 2 to the n circuit size, but they're not explicit. His argument was just like a random function will do it, so it's a non-constructive thing. And a major game in complexity theory is trying to find, like, uh, constructive versions of this, so like explicit languages um, in some not too high complexity class that require exponential size circuits. So like a huge life dream would be to find 
a language that's in NP that requires circuits of exponential size. But we're very far from uh, that. So the best sort of lower bound we have for a, a language in NP is like, depends on the exact gate model, but something like 5n. Uh, it's far from 2 to the exponential n. Now you can actually you know, do something, so I leave this as an exercise for you as well. Uh, there exists a language in x space. It's a truly enormous class, way bigger than p space, uh, such that L requires um, circuit size, well, even at least 2 to the n over n. Because x space is like enough resources to literally try out every single function, compute explicitly the, the, like the least size circuit that computes that function. So that's why you need exponential space to write down all these attempted circuits. And then you, you'll eventually find one. You can take the lexicographically first such uh, uh, circuit. Uh, and Shannon assures you that such a thing exists. But as I said, it would be like open to get this x space down to, we can get it down a little bit, but like to NP. But on the other hand, it's something that we believe is true, or let's say many people believe it's true, uh, that there are languages in NP that require exponential size circuits. It's a stronger statement than saying that there's languages in NP that require exponential time, which is in turn stronger than NP does not equal P, but it's still believable. So, uh, for example, SAT might be such a language. So, uh, it's a very strong assumption, but uh, there's maybe some, something called a non uniform, strong exponential time hypothesis would say uh, this um, for all k, there exists a positive epsilon such that the KSAT problem, which of course is in NP, uh, requires circuits of size almost exponential, 2 to the 1 minus epsilon n. Oops. So it's believable. Some people would believe this. I would believe this, that uh, you know, for circuits of size 2.999n, you know, there is some case such that case that really requires circuits of that size. But that's like a super far in the distance dream goal of complexity theory to prove such a statement. Maybe we'll prove it in the 21st century. <laughs> okay, so this class, uh, any questions? No. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, the quantifiers are wrong. Thanks. That's very confusing. It's extremely confusing. Sorry. Should of course say this. Thank you very much. Yeah, you really kind of would just want to say something like uh, CNF sat requires two to the omega k n time. It's a little bit annoying because like, uh, like sat has a problem. Like there's sort of two parameters, the number of inputs to the, s the in the sat formula you're trying to decide sat on and like the size of the formula itself. And so it's a little bit annoying to talk about that. But like k sat has the property that, you know, you can just assume that when k is a constant, the, the size of the formula is linearly related to the number of inputs to the formula. That's convenient. So therefore, it's a little convenient to state the, the, the conjecture like this. Thanks. OK. So yeah, this notion of uniformity, or like p uniformity, l uniformity, whatever, is like some way you can take a non-uniform complexity class definition like NC and make a uniform class out of it. Now I'll actually tell you about the opposite direction. If you have a uniform class, how you can make it into a non-uniform class. Exactly why you do want to do that, it's not so clear, but it does come up and it'll, uh, you know, it'll explain how you can take a uniform class and compare it to a circuit class. 
and uh, it will also explain this weird notation p slash poly. So uh, this is all an introduction to another definition of something called advice. So uh, in order to introduce and motivate advice, let me do it actually on this pane because I'll need a little space. Uh, Advice is a concept where like, you imagine a Turing machine that gets like, an extra input called the advice. And that input will depend on the input length. And in this way, it'll turn a uniform class into a non-uniform class. But to, to try to explain it, let me compare with NP. So there's uh, the certificate definition of NP. And in the certificate definition of NP, which, with, with which you're probably familiar, like there's an input x that uh, you care about, like a formula you want to know if it's satisfiable or not, which has some length n. OK, and then there's two characters in the story. Uh, there's v, which is like a polytone verifier, which is just a Turing machine. And that looks at x and tries to decide if it's in a language or not. But there's another character, which is like this wizard or a prover which eventually in this class gets called Merlin for, again, weird historical reasons. Some kind of like um, wizard that's like trying to convince uh, the verifier that the string x is in the language. And the, the Merlin can provide a certificate which is a string y of length polynomial in the length of x. But the, the key aspect of the definition is that, in some sense, this certificate is like untrustworthy. So like the verifier, you should think of the verifier as not really trusting the, the Merlin or the wizard who's providing the circuit. Or at least the, uh, the verifier is thinking, like, well, I better check what the wizard is really trying to tell me. So like for example, if it's the three-coloring language, which is an NP, x is the graph, and then you know, Merlin in an attempt to convince the verifier that the graph is three colorable, provides a supposed three coloring. That's the Y, the certificate. But it's untrustworthy. So V like checks for itself whether indeed this is a three coloring of the graph. Maybe you're wondering where I'm going with this. Uh, there's a similar situation, but different, called advice. OK. And in the world of advice, again, you have like a, a string x of length n. And like a polynomial time Turing machine is trying to decide if the string is in the language. But instead of like Merlin, there's an ad advisor who provides advice. And advice is, again, a string y of length polynomial in, well, typically, polynomial in the length of x. You can let that verify, uh, vary. Um, but uh, there's a little bit of a difference. So on one hand, you know, this is like your advisor. So that person is trustworthy, unlike <laughs> um, you know, weird <laughs> wizard that you meet on the street. Um, but on the other hand, your advisor also has like no time, so it's very like uh, you know, busy, and therefore just like tells, always tells like students the same thing, except maybe they tell them, you know, based on their level. So like if a freshman walks in, the advisor says one thing. If like a first year graduate student walks in, the advisor says another thing. Uh, but basically they have like only one piece of advice for each, you know, level. And what that means is the advice, uh, string y, only depends on, on uh, n, the length of the input. So it's like a weird scenario where uh, V is trying to decide if a string X is in the language, and it gets this like mystical uh, advice string Y, which helps it. Uh, but it gets the same string for every input length N, which is not so good. But the other point is it's trustworthy. So like it doesn't, it doesn't like say, oh man, I wonder if this advice is legit or whatever. It's like, oh great, this will help me do my job. Okay, so this is a, a story, but now I'll give you a definition. <laughs> uh, so um, typically the advice is of polynomial length, but let's make it more general. So an A of N uh, advice taking Turing machine. Let's 
what we're defining. Uh, it's, well, be a little informal here. On input x, it also gets uh, a read-only tape with a so-called advice string of length uh, a of n written on it, uh, a of length of x, uh, you know, depending only on length of x. So far, this doesn't, it's not like a complete definition or like, I mean, it's the definition of what a Turing machine is, but hopefully everything will make sense with this last definition I write. So finally, we say that uh, L, a language, is in the complexity class time t of n slash a of n. So this is read time t of n with a of n amount of advice. If there exists a time order t of n, uh, a of n advice taking Turing machine and there exists, and I'll come back to this important point in a second, advice strings y0, y1, y2, etc. where y uh, n has length at most uh, a of n, such that for all inputs x, um, m when run on x with advice y sub length of x uh, accepts if and only if x is an L. So let me look at this definition a little carefully. Somehow the trustworthiness of the advice comes into this quantifier that exists. So it's not like, you know, if in NMP where like if x is in the language, there's some good advice string that helps you confirm that. And if x is not in the language, then whatever weird advice string you get, you like disconfirm that x is in the language. No, it's like, you're in this complexity class. If there is some like magical and very helpful, trustworthy sequence of advice strings, which if you only knew them, then you'd be able to decide, you know, normally whether X is in the language or not. So slightly weird concept, uh, but it comes up. Um, okay, so the, the key is that you don't have to like check the advice. So let's do a, like a couple examples to make sure it makes sense. Um, also, this is very technical, but note here I didn't put a big O here because sometimes we're going to care about literally you know, one bit of advice. For example, any language L, which is unary, is in time n with one bit of advice. <laughs> so can somebody say why that is true? Yeah? The same thing is uh, why it can be solved by a side of one circuit because you can just give whether or not whether or not it's true. Right. So to show the language is in here, you just have to exhibit the good advice strings. And those advice strings, you know, the advice string for length n will literally just be Zero or one, whether or not one n is in, one to the n is in the language. Uh, one second. Um, and again, that doesn't have to be checked. Uh, yeah. What, what's the question? Question? Why is it have to be time n? Because um, you have to check all of the You have to. I sup, uh, you have to check. I suppose you have to check that all the bits are one in the input in the yes case. Uh, yeah, I thought about that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's it. Um, like, yeah, I'm imagining that it is a language that happens to be in like a unary language, albeit the tape alphabet is 0, 1. 
Um, yeah. Well, we also rarely consider running times less than n. But yeah, like it's super trivial. Like you just look at the advice and that tells you what to do. Uh, okay, uh, for notation's sake, let me uh, say that you can also define, if you like, um, you know, things like n time, t of n, slash a of n, like for any complexity class, you can like throw in a slash a of n basically and get uh, an advice version of it, which is kind of like a non-uniform version of it. And so based on this notation, like for any class, complexity class script C, you can invent this notation, script C slash poly, which just means, well, the union over k of script C slash, you know, k n to the k. So like any polynomial function advice, uh, amount of advice. Okay, so we can take this notation and let script C be p, polynomial time. Um, and then the theorem that I'll prove is that p slash poly is accurately named. What do I mean by this? Well, before I just told you this like, you know, uh, string of six symbols stood for the class of all languages computable by polynomial size circuit families. But now I've kind of given you a different definition of this string of six symbols. It's like all the languages solvable by a polynomial time Turing machine with a polynomial amount of advice. And the theorem is that this is the same thing. So therefore explaining the name. So let's see the proof of that. It's not hard. Okay, so it's two things we have to show. Uh, the first thing we have to show is that if your language decidable by a poly size uh, circuit family uh, C of n, we have to show that there exists, you know, a poly time, poly advice taking TM that decides the same language. Okay, so I imagine you have a language, it's decided by some circuit family C of n of polynomial size. Now I have to invent this polynomial time Turing machine that takes a polynomial amount of advice and decides the same language. So, how do I show that? Yeah? Right, so the proof of this is just that the advice strings, uh, you know, the, the advice string for length and inputs is the description of the nth circuit in the family. So this is a poly n sized string because it's a polynomial sized circuit family. So that's okay advice. And if the Turing machine actually gets this magical, wonderful advice, the, the description of all these circuits, or the description of the nth circuit, then to decide if x is in the language or not, it just has to get that advice and like evaluate that circuit on that input. And evaluating a polynomial sized circuit on a Fixed input is certainly doable in polynomial time. So that's one direction. And uh, what about the other direction? So suppose, uh, conversely, that I have a poly n time, poly n advice taking. Uh, Turing machine M deciding some language, and I want to show that it has a polynomial sized circuit family. How do I do this half of the proof? Uh, yeah? Same way that you did the other Except now you're just including your question. Right. Right. So we know when you have a polynomial time Turing machine, you can kind of convert it to a polynomial size circuit family by this you know, gadget construction. The T squared one is easier. Um, right. So as usual, construct the circuit from the machine. That'll be polynomial size so far. Now, uh, it's actually uniform so far. There's still the advice, but you know, you just have one advice string of like maybe n to the 10 for every 
uh, input length n. So you can just like hardwire that in, if you will, hardwire in the length n advice string into the nth circuit. Okay, and this really actually exploits non-uniformity because um, you know the circuit family it exists by virtue of the fact that this magical sequence of advice strings exists. And, you know, it's maybe not possible to construct these from scratch in polynomial time, but that's okay. Okay, questions? It's sort of a funny concept, but uh, yeah. If we were able to construct those instructions from scratch in polytime, then we'd be back where we started with the... That's right. So, like, uh, getting a polynomial amount of advice for each input length is sort of only extra useful or, like, particularly useful if it's, like, advice that the polynomial time Turing machine could not have figured out by itself in polynomial time. Yeah? Uh, can you explain how, like, hot wiring in the advice helps? Yeah, so um, like maybe in a few more details what it looks like, right? You have some Turing machine, uh, M, that takes advice and like you're trying to convert it to a circuit family. So like for each input string N, you need to build a circuit. And it's going to be this like tableau thing again. Or somehow like... Uh, this is where the input comes in, and that's like the free input to this nth circuit. That could be any n-bit string. But this Turing machine, like it needs to get going, like it needs to know what is on that advice tape. Those like n to the 10 maybe advice bits. Um, but they exist, so for this is, you know, C of n. Um, these like you hire hardwire in, like if the magical advice string of length n to the 10 is like 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1 or something, then you just really stick that into the nth circuit. Okay, I guess when I defined circuits, I didn't say you could include constant gates, but I don't know. You can make a one by x or not x. Yep. Uh, like, that machine has to decide, like, both, for example, like, uh, both, like, uh, say, like, say that uh, you're constructing a circuit for, like, if percent seven, then you, like, you have to construct uh, the circuit that works for both, like, have three advice size four and also time four advice size three, and wouldn't those be different? Uh, when you have a poly size, uh, uh, when you have um, maybe I see what you're saying in the sense that like, would it improve? Or would it answer your question if I changed it to this, like so that like the advice string was always of length a of n. If, if that doesn't prove things, then maybe I should uh, put it like that. In fact, let's say it's like this. I mean, the machine can always sort of ignore extra advice if it doesn't want it. So it's, it's not really, it, I don't think it really changes anything to make this uh, equals A of n. So then it's really like for every, maybe I should have defined it this way in the beginning. For every input length, you get like a fixed advice string of like a fixed function length A of your input. So this will be like exactly known. Maybe it doesn't really matter though, because if, if the advice function happened to be shorter, then it's okay. Like, nobody has to construct this. It's enough that these circuits exist. So if like, the advice string for like seven happened to be not seven to the 10, but like less than seven to the 10, then it would still be okay. Yep. It also seems like you don't have to have those zeros and ones be inputs to the circuit. They could just be like, X and not X for the zeros and the X or. Yeah, or, yeah, or like really, you can just look into the circuit as if this were here, and like if this zero is feeding into an AND gate, then just like delete that AND gate, or but if it's feeding in, into an OR gate, just delete that wire, or I guess if it's feeding into AND gate, like propagate the zero down. Yeah. Okay, so I'll basically stop here. Let me uh, say one more thing that we'll get to pretty soon. This advice looks kind of weird, um, but like one case where it will come up is We'll prove not too long from now that the complexity class BPP, everything solvable by efficient uh, randomized algorithms, is contained in P slash poly. So we don't necessarily know that every uh, randomized algorithm can be de-randomized to a deterministic polynomial time algorithm, but it can be de-randomized to deterministic poly sized circuits. And somehow the trick will be that like um, the advice will just be like a really great random string. 
that the algorithm, the, determinist, the deterministic uniform algorithm can use to make its random choices? Well, making that work takes a little bit of thought, but it's not too hard, so we'll see it soon. Okay, see you on Tuesday.